Hello guys, it's John. This is Other Things Lightly. This is a new solo pod, a series. We may all be operating under a false assumption, especially people listening to this podcast, and I'm going to try to figure it out. And here is the idea on this solo pod. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I think that saying has been in my craw for a long time, maybe since I was like seven. And I want to investigate it today on Heavy Things Lightly. You guys hear that music? That's Greg Gilbertson. I love it. When you hear this, we will be full swing on two different, very cool Art of Tamada events that are fundraisers for our work. We will be putting new people in the field. And we're looking for more, especially if you are interested in going to Africa, Mozambique, or Sierra Leone. If you poke around, you'll also see there's other things happening. We're looking for volunteers in various ways, but to do, it's like online stuff. It's very hard to volunteer here in America when we're trying to create like really cool local projects around the world. But there are ways. And there's a restaurant and there's Supras and Tamadas. There's the idea that at first things right now, you know what we're doing? This is number one. We are just doing the law of generosity, the law of love, and the law of relationship. They just build giant, massive, just piles of, of fulfillment within human beings. And we found ourselves doing them all around the world. Join us. Donate. Participate. We love you. Here's another podcast. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. So I was digging around because I really want to investigate this phrase and see if it's old world or new world. And when I was digging around, I realized is that basically this aphorism, this truism, it seems untrue. It also weirdly I don't know if it's old or new, but I'm going to tell you what I found. I think this way always struck me as a very rational way of thinking because it's kind of like, how did your uncle use this phrase or your dad or your, I don't know, maybe your mom, you are 12 and you see a homeless person and you go, Oh my God, I want to give them some money. And then they would say, Hey, be careful. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, little one. You're like, wait a minute, though. I just really want to help this guy. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, little man. I, I, at that point, whenever I was hearing this growing up, I think I was supposed to like be able to like see around the corner and into the future about what this guy's going to do with my five cents. I'm like, you could have given him directly a French fry into his mouth. Instead, you chose to allow him to buy drugs. The road to hell, buddy never sat well with me wait a minute you mean oh my gosh you mean you put up this little baseball field in your backyard so all the neighbor neighbor kids could play and then one of the neighbor kids accidentally well the bat went flying hit another neighbor kid in the head the road to hell buddy paved with good intentions i know you wanted to play baseball offer something to the neighbor should have thought about that though It doesn't feel right. So guess what? I want to investigate whether this phrase that seems to imply that I have the power to shape the future if I just thought enough, I just thought about it a little bit more. I want to do a pod, and we're doing it right now, that tries to figure out where this aphorism fits in the world we call old and new. Before we get into it, I want to introduce you to Physics Girl. And do you know what Physics Girl is? Do you know who that is? I didn't know that until this rabbit hole I went in called this podcast. But now I know about it. Damn. I'm clearly late to the game. This this woman has 3.5 million followers. I think she might be a superhero, a superheroine. Or maybe she's just a woman who is exactly what Neil deGrasse Tyson is. Like a science nerd, but white and blonde and less annoying. I digress, I know, but Physics Girl is necessary for our story because, well, she goes on her own journey. She goes to a, on a journey to a place called CERN. 
C-E-R-N, which is the acronym for the French Council of European Research on Nuclear Things, more or less. Conseil European pour les recherches nucléaires. <laughs> That's also the place where our podcast, this one right here, this heavy thing lightly is going to end. It will end in three episodes from now. And I can't wait for this four part extravaganza. So let's hear from Physics Girl right now. Let's hear her just give us a little bit about CERN and the world of the light people, those who are enlightened. World is created. So Wikipedia mm -hmm. seems confident, but I'm not so sure we can even call it material because That's it's right. not made of regular matter. This stuff is the rarest and potentially the most dangerous on Earth. And scientists from around the world are She's just trying to figure out how to investigating put it in the and carry it across the matter, antimatter. But what is antimatter and why is there so little of it? It's the rarest substance on Earth. It's the rarest substance in the universe. But scientists theorize mm. that the Big Bang should have created a universe with equal anti -matter. amounts of matter and antimatter. And yet we look around and see almost completely matter. Why? That is surprisingly one of the biggest unanswered questions in physics, and we're going to dive into it. Okay, so physics girl wants to go find out what's going on at CERN because the, busy, the biggest question maybe left in physics is, is why, why is there so much matter and not more antimatter? So if you're with me, physics girl does this kind of stuff with physics all the time, but this one's a big trip to CERN where they do nuclear stuff. And, well, let's just watch a little bit more. One of the biggest unanswered questions in physics, and we're gonna dive into it. Hey, I'm Diana, and you're watching Physics Girl. I am back in the United States, but I recently traveled to Switzerland, mm. initially to speak at EPFL in Lausanne, but I decided to stop by the most impressive scientific whoa, whoa, facility whoa, whoa. on so that's Earth. Physics Girl going to CERN, the most impressive scientific facility on Earth, bum, bum, bum. On this pod, one of the fundamental organizing principles is that everybody is religious. And I've been crying about it, you know, new world, old world, we act like we're not religious, but we just have a different God, all that stuff. Well, if that's true, like a little, then this place, CERN, the most impressive scientific facility on Earth, is also the most impressive worship temple on earth. We'll figure out about which God they're worshiping. But if this religion concept, this paradigm that I'm using is true, and you could be like, well, that's not really true, John. I haven't proven. I haven't tried to prove it. I'm just giving you an idea, right? Then this place, CERN, it deserves some attention. And before we're done on this pod series, we're going to get it of a lot of attention. It's going to get a lot of attention. And Physics Girl is sort of our guide. She's going to help us take apart this idea. Is the road to hell paved with good intentions? Because, spoiler alert, it's not. The road to hell is paved with no intentions. But we'll get there. So, first of all, about our phrase that Physics Girl is helping us understand. It's not in the Bible. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Feels Jesus-y, feels a little Jesus-y, not in the Bible. If you like the Bible as a type of content test, and if you believe that the content that's not in the Bible is sort of haram, well, that this little phrase should be haram, which is the Muslim phrase for unacceptable, forbidden, right? And I'm joking when I use that phrase because maybe it's a Muslim phrase, right? Hmm. The road to hell is paved with good. Maybe that's in the Quran. What? If you look in the Quran, or even in the hadiths, the, the sayings, the sort of famous sayings of the prophet, well, there's one phrase that says paradise is surrounded by hardships and the fire is surrounded by desires. But that doesn't, doesn't feel like the same thing. Paradise is surrounded by hardships and the fire is surrounded by desires. Hmm doesn't feel like that's the same idea. That's as close as I could find during my long hours of research, which I actually 
I'm like weirdly obsessed with this, but I like to research this stuff. So guess what? On your behalf, guess what? We're not finding that phrase in the Bible. We're not finding it in the Quran, but maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's somewhere else. Maybe it's like classical. Maybe it comes from the classical ancient era. So we look and we find something from Virgil, the Roman poet, something like 600 years before Muhammad, right around the time of Christ. There's this, Virgil says, the descent to hell is an easy way down. But again, that's a bit of a stretch to say that that old world Latin Virgil poet guy is saying what we're saying whenever your uncle tells you maybe you ought to reconsider giving that dollar to that homeless guy because don't forget, little fellow, the road to hell was paved with good intentions. So it's not in the Bible, sort of not in the Quran. It's sort of not really an ancient Greek thing. Where does this come from? Here's some more info from the interwebs. John Wesley, the father of all things Methodist, he clearly cites the Road to Hell aphorism in a sermon in 1741. Mm. Here are his words written down and committed to history. Hell is paved, one says, with good intentions. Hmm, 1741. Ah, the one. Hell is paved, one says. The one here he's mentioning is not Neo from the Matrix. It's not Bono. And in history, it's very unclear who he is saying says this. It seems that he is doing what many of us do. It's He's using a type of common knowledge. How did it become common? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Well, John Fox, maybe the most influential ever Protestant preacher of his time, he quotes William Tinsdale, maybe the most influential and definitely one of the most famous of all the early Protestants. He was the guy executed because he was a linguist trying to move everything into English, everything from the Bible, all the holy writ, especially the Bible into English. Fox. And Tyndale, well, Fox quotes Tyndale and he says, beware of good intents. And it seems that those guys living in the 1500s were the first ever to reference this aphorism this way. Beware of good intents. And Fox quotes Tyndale as saying that. 1580s. And that seems kind of like related to the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So as little history buffs, we're making progress. By 1791, biographies of Samuel Johnson. Now, biographers writing about Samuel Johnson. Well, all of those people in the Oxford Dictionary included, they say he was the greatest English writer of all time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people even think he was Shakespeare. Yeah, I don't think that's true. Biographers in England, right, what they're doing, they're saying Samuel Johnson said this, Sir, the hell that you know of is paved with good intentions. Ooh. And by 1855, the famous English publisher, a guy named Henry Bond, he had published a popular reader called the Handbook of Proverbs, where the actual phrase, word for word, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. The actual phrase can first be found, published word for word as I'm telling it to you. It's published in 1855 and believed by light people everywhere. And don't try to get out of it. I bet you believe that that is a truism. It's a proverb with reverb. It's like wise. It's a way to live, a way to be. But is it? Come on. Is it? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. I wonder what physics girl, the ultimate light person, might think about the road to hell being paved with good intentions. And I wonder what old world Christians, let's say Christians before the light people, I've been thinking about, I wonder what they would say about this proverb. and. That's the next episode. We dig into the understanding of actions and thoughts and goodness in hell. And we do it 
by following Physics Girl on her trip to CERN. And I find it an amazing conflaboration. That's not a word, but everything gets conflaborated. And we're going to dig into it. Well, before we go, though, let's watch Physics Girl introduce the antimatter project at the Temple of Science called CERN. And as you listen, as a precursor to where we're going next, I just want you to listen and ask yourself as you hear her talk, why is CERN a thing? Just ask yourself. To me, it's the same question. Why is NASA a thing? Why is CERN a thing? Why are they doing antimatter experiments? See if you can decipher. Or another way of saying this is ask yourself, what is the intention of people at CERN? Don't worry, down the road, we're actually going to read their intentions, but you'll find out something. It's confusing. So let's dig into physics, girl. Just let's just listen for a minute and a half and uh, then we'll finish. Yeah, here it is. It's not a coincidence that the antimatter factory is at CERN. You need these super energetic particles driven by the massive particle accelerators at CERN to create mm-hmm. antimatter. Well, the way they are generated, you have these you know, collisions, big amount of energy, and from this, um, you automatically have a side product right. being antiprotons that are created. Uh-huh. So they they're... need to direct the antiprotons toward the AD hall using these giant coils of wire. It's okay. connected to some transformers, there you which go. will send if this you can current see it, to the magnet, so you can have these there's tiny massive investments in this. For your beam path. So all that specialized equipment and, and the crazy amounts of energy you use to create energetic particles is part of why antimatter is so expensive. In 2006, antimatter costs an estimated $25 billion per gram to make. So that's cool. Thanks, CERN. $25 billion per gram to make. Now, apparently they can't make much of it, as we'll find out. But just watch. But watch like a oh, like a scientist. What's the talos? What are they trying to do again? Sounds like a lot, but that's just for positrons. For antiprotons, some estimates put the cost at about three quadrillion dollars per gram. To figure out why antimatter is so rare, we have to first look at why it can be so dangerous. When antimatter comes into contact with regular matter, they annihilate, they disappear, and they turn into pure light energy. If one teaspoon of antimatter came into contact with regular matter, it would create an explosion large enough to destroy all of Manhattan. For comparison, you'd need about 200,000 metric tons we'll get to the of comparison. TNT to release the same amount of energy. Oh, oh, there's power in them narrow hills. Hmm. CERN. This massive, hmm. So, wow. Okay, so something's going on, and that something going on is that there's a lot of juice to be controlled. Or 10 we think, nuclear bombs. According to her. To make it even more relatable, the amount of antimatter you would need to destroy the moon would be equivalent to the same mass of all the fish on Earth. Mm. (laughs) But let's be clear, the small amount of antimatter that we're capable of making with current technologies is in no way dangerous. So what is antimatter? What is this stuff that's capable of annihilating with regular matter? This stuff would look just like regular matter if we had enough of it to be able to see it. Amazingly, scientists predicted that antimatter should exist before they discovered it, which is going to help us figure out what it is. She's going to go on. We're coming back to her, guys. If you see the solo pod, and it's called Road to Hell, we're going to get back to this. But I got a question. I might not understand if we listen to that right. We don't really know what antimatter is. It's mysterious. We do know there's a massive facility that she went on pilgrimage to that is actually trying to figure out what antimatter is, but it's mysterious, we don't know. We do know somehow that it can destroy pretty much the universe, well, or at least all of Manhattan, like a lot of times, but it's only a teaspoon, so with a teaspoon, maybe they get, okay. But don't worry, we can't make enough of this teaspoon stuff um, to actually hurt anybody. We think, because we don't actually understand what it is. But it can destroy the universe, probably. But don't be alarmed because we can't really make enough of it. Though we trying because we found out the cost of it, 25 billion for what is it? In other words, why does CERN exist again? (laughs) 
The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, the CERN exists because the stuff stuff exists, so CERN exists. It's interesting. I dare you to go to their website. Yeah, we'll figure that out. But we'll end this week. Next time we'll check back in, okay? And we'll go further on our journey with Physics Girl by going further on our journey with this aphorism. Why uh, is the road to hell paved with good intentions? And as we do, we'll try to do it lightly even though apparently it's a very heavy thing guys see you soon may we all be at a table together on first things foundation wait wait with first things foundation people i don't know supporting a good cause but mostly just eating and drinking and celebrating as we should in the georgian tradition peace out gagi marjos check us out www.first-things.org much love from south carolina